Okay, let's keep going. Uh, that's another example. Talk about this person uh, because she could not feel pain, so she she died at a young age. Uh, if she can feel pain, she probably will will try to fix the problem. So, uh, pain is a protective mechanism, and the pain is pretty interesting because you can have uh, a lot of stimulus and you feel no pain, like the previous example. We talk about the congenital insensitivity of pain. Uh, the person who could not feel pain, or uh, we can trick your brain and make your brain feel okay it it works like placebo placebo effect we talk about it in chapter one uh, if it if your brain believe it works it gonna work that's placebo effect and um, also your attention can affect your pain sensation like some sometimes people are too focused on doing something they forget the pain uh, that's the video I, I if you're interested you can take a look uh, this person he's the a uh, UFC fighter, he broke his toe during the fighting and apparently his brain was too busy focused on the fighting so his brain ignored the, the pain sensation and it until he, he won and he suddenly he found his toe was broken and you can, you can watch his behavior totally change after he figured out his toe was broken so it shows you your attention can, can affect your pain sensation and the pain theory, the pain stuff from the peripheral nervous system, uh, peripheral will go to your spinal cord because most of the pain sensation come from your body. You go to the spinal cord, from the spinal cord to the brain. And because of that, you can have a gate here. They call the gate theory. So in the spinal cord, it's, it's a theory is about 1965, and you have a gate here. So you can open, close the gate to block the pain sensation. So if you close the gate here, the pain sensation won't go to your brain, so you don't feel the pain. And the application is the, the, the epidural surgery. So epidural is you put the local anesthesia in the lumbar area, that's your spinal cord, that's the lumbar. They have to go through the, uh, the cartilage, the fibro cartilage between the vert vertebrates and send the uh, local anesthesia here and block the pain sensation. And once you block block it and the pain close the gate, it will go to the brain. So so they block the pain, but you can still feel the others. And let's look at the neurotransmitter. So uh, we have twelve different kind of neurotransmitters, and the one associated with the pain sensation is substance P. That's the neurotransmitter used by the neuron to transduct the pain sensation. In animal study, they can create a transgenic mice and they decrease the substance P level. It turned out uh, these animals have a bigger tolerance of pain sensation. Another neural molecule, uh, this part is called the neurotransmitter, but usually they, the scientists don't call it the neurotransmitter. They call it the neuropeptide or neuromodulator. It's called the endorphin. We talk about endorphin. It's endomorphin because it's a it's like a morphine molecule. Excuse me. It directly binds with the, uh, the the opiate receptor, so it can modulate. It can decrease the pain sensation. Uh, when 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 you release the endorphin, so like you exercise, uh, giving birth, like these big big events happen in your body, it can it can cause the endorphin release. And let's look at the last thing about the pain sensation is the phantom limb. The phantom limb is, is, is a pretty old. If you look at the literature in the 18th, 19th century, they talk about the phantom limb. They talk about, talk about the people that lose an arm, lose a leg, and they complain their, their, their arm hurt, even though they don't have the arm anymore. And turn out people don't treat them well because they don't have an arm and they complain the, the pain from the arm so it must be ghost that's why they call it phantom limb and they beat those persons sometimes they kill them and until World War II because we have a lot of veterans uh, they lose the arm and they complain about the pain and we have the system, systematic study of the phantom limb and eventually they figure out till the World War II they figure out what happens why we can have phantom limb and about 80% of the amputees experience phantom limb, phantom pain. And some of them hurt a lot. They have to use morphine to stop the pain. 
and apparently it does not come from the physical stimulus because they don't have the limb anymore and it's the neuronal activity so as I keep telling you in the sensory system all your sensation come from your neuronal activity and the the body sensation go to your somatosensory cortex and in your somatosensory cortex you have a lot of neurons receive the input from the hand and they are pretty happy because neurons are designed to generate action potential and you use your hand a lot so they receive a lot of input and suddenly this person uh, lose the arm so these neurons they receive no input and they are not happy because neurons are designed to generate action potential and we talk about the neuron have the neural plasticity. They are able to extend their axon out, connect with other neuron to form the new connection. And they always want to do that. So they start to connect with other neurons. They form the new neural connection with other neuron. And when they connect with other neuron, and the other neurons fire, they will generate action potential as well. And when they generate action potential, because their job is the arm sensation. So this person feel like the arm hurt a lot even though he does not have the arm anymore. And sometimes they'll feel the, the sense change, like you touch their face, they feel like the arm being touched for the same reason, because once the connections uh, of this been established, you activate the facial neuron, they will activate the arm neuron. So you touch different body parts, they feel like the, the arm being touched. And after two centuries, till the World War II, mid 20th century finally we have a good explanation of the phantom pen so this tell you your sensation come from the neuronal activity not coming from the the physical stimulus uh, let's look at the other two chemical senses gustatory and olfactory uh, your test that's on your papilla that's on your tongue so these are papilla and on the papilla you have the small small this this we call the test bud. So in the test bud, they are able to test different uh, flavor. You have five different flavors: four traditional one and the fifth one, the new one. So you have the sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and the new one is called umami. Umami is the MSG. It's a glutamate. Uh, glutamate. You can use the artificial one. This the MSG. Um, umami is a savory flavor. So if you like the sashimi, you like the fresh seafood. Uh, why they taste so good? Because they have a lot of umami. And in some uh, Japanese restaurant, they're going to use the, the seaweed to make their broth. And they also have a lot of umami. And you say there's no spicy. No, spicy actually activate your pain receptor in your, in your mouth. But eventually, it's all the flavors plus the pain sensation and plus the smell. Don't forget the smell. The food need to taste good. They also need to smell good. And all the combination of all of them go to your brain and make make the food taste good. So these are the flavor. And let's look at the smell olfactory. So this is still a chemical molecule, and this molecule need to go to your nasal cavity and bind on the upper part of your nasal cavity. And when you get sick, all this nasal cavity being blocked by the mucus because the goblet cells, the cells produce mucus, they produce way too much. All this being blocked. And you found you lose your appetite because you don't smell the food. So a big part of the smell is uh, entertaining your life, make your the life smell, uh, make the food smells good. And on the upper part of your nasal cavity, that's the olfactory bulb and their fiber extend out, extending out. And they will touch the chemical molecule. So the gas molecule will touch this and will, uh, this, this cell's receptor gonna release neurotransmitter and eventually generate action potential, go to your brain. And we don't know olfactory system too much uh, because not too many studies uh, were done in this part. We have a lot of studies done in the visual system and one reason is our main system and second everybody is interested in the visual and we know more about the olfactory uh, till 2004 the Nobel Prize winner uh, studied the olfactory system and it's a pattern it's a pattern it's not the one molecule trigger the smell it's a it's a pattern say this molecules this, this uh, smell have 20 different molecules it can activate 20 
and they will combine those 20 when they send to the brain and also it will compare with your memory you smell this food before and after they activate these 20 patterns it go to the brain and you know oh this is a barbecue I like it and we can fine tune one or two and you change the pattern a little bit when you go to your brain you know oh okay this barbecue is overcooked and it's, it's the pattern of the activity trigger the sensation trigger the smell and sometimes you like this pattern sometimes well you don't like this pattern even though it still smells good so this part the perfume company they like it a lot they they, they always try to fine-tune this pattern and create the best perfume and let's look at their application in human both of them their function is give you the flavor and also the olfactory we talk about uh, thalamus all the information go to your brain need to go through the thalamus go to your cortex the olfactory is the only exception uh, it will directly go to your brain bypass the thalamus it will activate your limbic system and we talk about the limbic system's function limbic system is emotion and memory it turned out your olfactory is a big trigger of memory old memory emotion related memory think about how many songs novels talk about uh, they smell something and trigger those old memory because olfactory is a big trigger of emotion related memory and the reason is it directly connect with the limbic system and your uh, chemical senses in human is just used to entertain your life in animals like nocturnal like this guy uh, they they need to have a system they work pretty well when there's no light and it turned out their olfactory system become their uh, social communication system uh, the, the mice right you can see their the cortex is pretty smooth indicate they're, they're not very smart this olfactory ball this huge it's almost almost the half size of the cortex and they're gonna release the pheromone pheromone is a chemical molecule uh, released to the air and uh, the the mice the the menstrual cycle is four days, so uh, after the the female is during when the female is ovulating, they will release the pheromone to the air, and the male can smell the pheromone and go to uh, find the female and produce more uh, pups. So it becomes their social communication system. Do humans have pheromone? Uh, some people say yes. Some people say no. And we even have the perfume company. They claim uh, they 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 add the pheromone into the perfume. And think about it: if you purchase the perfume, uh, you use it, you wear it, you go to a party, and every guy is crazy for you. They don't even know why it worth the money, right? That's the pheromone. It turned out that some studies show the men humans human have the pheromone system. Uh, let's talk about one study. It will it will show that in. Uh, in girls in in the when they go to the college they live together it take about it all start with all four of them uh, they have different menstrual cycle it take about one semester and their cycle are synchronized and they say well the reason is because of the pheromone communication system so this one uh, study indicate probably human have the pheromone system and there are, there are also other studies talk about the human pheromone. If you are interested in uh, psychology, have a lot of studies about the human pheromone. And some of them ask uh, the guys come to smell the shirt of the, the girls after the exercise. And they found that one smells good, uh, have more pheromone because they are ovulating. So there are some studies talk about the human pheromone. Okay, the last two slides uh, talk about all the perception studies. Uh, they, they identify the provider stimulus and it's not like you have a complete threshold say below it you hear nothing above it you hear it it's more like this kind of smooth curve is you provide a hundred stimulus if it's below the threshold a hundred of them you will say no if it's a very strong stimulus a hundred of them will say yes and how do they identify it? this is the threshold is they provide the sound a hundred times and in 50 times you hear it, the other 50 times you don't hear it. That's we know, okay, that's the sound of your threshold. And that's how they do experiment in all sensory, including the auditory, including the visual and the others. Okay, that's it.